Welcome back to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. My name is Art and I'm the host. And today we are looking into the history side of my bookshelf. Uh, my guest today is Max Friedman. Now, Max spent five years researching and writing Painful Joy, which is part memoir, part biography, and part genealogical mystery, a story focused primarily on his parents, who were uh, Polish Holocaust survivors. Uh, they lost everyone dur during World War II and their families, including their first spouses and children. They survived the camps and then met and married in Sweden. And Max is a result of that marriage, and he's also my guest today. Uh, so Max, welcome to the Bookshelf Odyssey podcast. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, uh, and thank you for sharing the story about your, your parents. I know it's not an easy one, but these are important stories to share. Yeah, I, I, th I think so. It, uh, it it was difficult to research and write, and there were a lot of emotional points along the way. But uh, I thought it, it it was finally time to tell their story, so I did. And we'll we'll get into the book uh, "Painful Joy" here in a few minutes. And again, just a head, heads up: some of the things we might talk about uh, for listeners might be troubling to you. If it is, you know, make sure you take care of yourself, and if you need to listen on a different day or something that's uh, we understand that for sure to start off with uh, I like to ask my guests uh, about their reading are, are you a big reader and what have you been reading lately well given the subject of, of this book uh, you might not be surprised but I I read to escape mm. uh, and so I you know I, I, I go run through and gobble whether it's Daniel Silva or the Reacher books, or the mm -hmm. Jacqueline Winspear books, or the uh, the Lee Child and uh, the Parker books. Mm -hmm. So I, I do that. I actually picked up uh, a book which uh, is timely. Uh, it, it's called Strong Men. Mm -hmm. So I've been looking at that book, and it's by a woman named Ruth Ben Giat, and mm -hmm. it's about uh, the the rise of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's sort of fascinating because she looks at characteristics of authoritarian figures through starting with move, moving on through uh, all, all, the, all the ones that we know about mm -hmm. um, and, and points to all kinds of interesting things that I never thought about, uh, like machismo and charisma. Charisma, yes, but the importance of propaganda and the importance of making people worry and question what is true mm. and and therefore allow them to sort of take the reins of what is true and and it's you know the times we're in are difficult times and and it seemed like a, 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 a an interesting take on a very complicated subject so, yeah that sounds very timely definitely yeah. but that's one of the things i love about reading myself is you can do it either to educate yourself or to escape <laughs> if things get too hard. You know, it can be like, well, you mentioned uh, the the Reacher books, uh, Jack Reacher. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just started reading that series. Um, I've read the first two books, I think, in the series. And then I, I watched the Amazon show, which I really enjoyed. Right. The Amazon show was because you know, there was also besides the Am Amazon show i think they also did a take with uh doing reacher with tom cruise yeah if i'm mm -hmm. not mistaken and and the two physically are quite different <laughs> very different yeah <laughs> absolutely but yeah that's that's some uh that's some good escapist stories right there <laughs> well uh and like i mentioned uh one of the reasons why i read is is to learn and and to educate myself as well and that's kind of where your your book, uh, Painful Joy, would would fall. You know, I I mentioned to you before we started. I I've been reading it. I I haven't finished it yet, but I always hes hesitate about a book like this to say that I enjoyed it. You know, because it's about such a very dark, serious subject matter. But uh, I I'm I guess better put, I'm I'm thankful for it and books like it that shed the light on what happened, even though it might be. A very dark subject 
Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And and in doing the research, obviously, as I said, it, it was an emotional experience in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, there were some amazing surprises. Just just out of the blue, it, it turned out that the uh, the setting that uh, that Steven Spielberg used for Schindler's List. Uh, there's a there's a, a part of the film that takes place in the Krakow ghetto. Mm -hmm. And uh, Krakow Ghetto was where my mother and her family were were living, or okay. were forced to live. And they actually used uh, the tenement that my mother lived in for 25 years as the central scene for the Krakow Ghetto. And so if you go to Schindler's List, you would see where my mother lived. Uh, and, and it even wasn't where the Krakow ghetto was, but but it just sort of came up out of the blue, sure. and it's become actually a tourist attraction in uh, in Poland, mm. which my mother I think would have enjoyed. Yeah, the fact that uh, that people are coming and and looking at the place where she lived and uh, suffered, but uh, but she, my mother liked to be the center of attention, and this this would have been good <laughs> for her. That film itself uh, is. A powerful film and I've only watched it once and I don't know if I could watch it again I, I just remember being very very affected by it yeah and, yeah. and that that actually it came out in 1994 and mm -hmm. and and for those who read the book you'll see I, I avoided this entire subject for most of my life mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was sort of painful just living with these two people and and their memories and their nightmares so i didn't really want to know much more and it was only when i went to see schindler's list that all the stories that my mother had told us as almost bedtime stories i hate to say mm -hmm. about her experiences in the concentration camps and such suddenly were on the screen suddenly there was mm -hmm. there was amon get uh there was uh Joseph Mengele, there were the different camps that my mother was in, and that was her story. And we didn't believe a lot of what she said, and it turned out, while some of it wasn't the case, there was a lot of things that, that suddenly opened my eyes to, to a subject that I really didn't want to hear about. And then you mentioned that uh, your 11-year-old grandson encouraged you to, to write this story, uh, your book, Painful Joy, is... How, yeah. how did that all come about? Uh, he he and I had spoken a bit when he was younger mm -hmm. uh, about sort of difficult times in in a family life, and I and I sort of mentioned how things sometimes are are not easy for little kids, and I told him about my mother, and I said my mother lived through a very bad time in in history and in her life, and she was a tough lady. And there was a reason for it, uh, but she was, as I told him, a survivor. Mm -hmm. And so then one day he came to me and he said, uh, so what is this about surviving? If, uh, if and this is a woman he never met, mm -hmm. uh, but if your mother was a survivor, then maybe then you have something in you that helps you survive. And that means that my dad, my son, his father, maybe has something in him. And that means that maybe he, my grandson, has some strength of a survivor as well in him. And he wanted to know more. And frankly, I couldn't tell him anymore. So mm. I went off and tried to write this book. You describe yourself as a, as a second generation Holocaust survivor, which um, basically means, you know, your, your parents experienced that. You are you know, a product of their marriage and all that. But I, I would say in some ways, and maybe you've seen this too, that the trauma they experienced kind of affects you or affected yeah, you at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is actually a chapter in the book just about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it affected me. It affected my sister probably even more. She's older than me. Mm -hmm. And so she met my parents as a, as a baby Uh just a year, well, a year and a half after, uh, after the camps, after they were in the camps and their liberation, and uh, so uh, my sister, for example, whenever she would go and give blood, uh, you would put a tourniquet 
you know, a little rubber thing mm-hmm. around to try to uh, find where the vein is. And she she would tell me that she most often fainted when that happened because she felt as though she was being hanged, as mm-hmm. my mother would talk about hangings, and she felt this around her neck. And uh, they wouldn't allow a dog into their house because it was the dogs that were uh, guarding the uh, people at the selection. And my mother would tell us about that. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, there there was there was a lot of when we were young, we would have to sort of wake them up from their nightmares. They both suffered from serious PTSD, and uh, so, and in fact, even for me, uh, once a psychiatrist uh, cautioned me about trying to mimic their survival and be a survivor myself. I was working somewhere. And my boss was really a terrible sort of guy. Mm-hmm. And I stuck with it. And at some management meeting I went to, there were industrial psychiatrists there to talk about problems in your in your workplace. So I told him about my boss and how he, he really w- was, was brutal uh, and psychologically. Uh, but I stuck with it. it, it I'd been with him for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And then he asked me more about my background, and I told him about my parents, just very briefly. I mm-hmm. wanted to know what they did or where they came from. And when he heard Survivor, he said, you know, you're mimicking your parents. You're you're trying to survive, and you're not willing to leave. They had no choice. You have a choice. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty interesting. Wow, Yeah it's almost like without thinking about it, you're, you're just repeating what they right. did exactly for, for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. It was all unconscious and, uh, mm-hmm. and I never really thought about that way, but that there, it, it struck a chord. Mm-hmm. Now, can you walk us through briefly, just, just this, what your story overall is about? It, it's described as kind of a part memoir, part history, uh, part or part biography and, and genealogical mystery. Sure. Yeah. So basically, there are two parts to the book. The first Mm -hmm. part basically is about finding out who my parents were before the war and what happened to them during the war. We only met them after the war when we were born. Mm -hmm. So the first part I knew nothing about. I didn't know that my parents had any anybody before. I I knew that they had suffered. That them we would hear again and again how many that they lost all their families and everybody, and they did, they lost everybody. Uh, Everybody was murdered. Uh, But we didn't know who who these people were, how many there were, what their names were, where they lived, where they were born, what kind of mothers or fathers they had, virtually nothing. My father spoke even less than my mother about the war. He only told us, told me about his wife and two little girls when I was 20 years old. Uh, and so uh, the the first part was just going through archives, uh, getting things translated, uh, both in Poland and in, uh, in Sweden, mm-hmm. because they were in, they met in Sweden after their liberation. Uh, the Swedish Red Cross brought a number of the survivors of Bergen Belsen to Sweden to recuperate, and and so the first half is just finding out who they were and and just and what where they lived, and then we actually went to all these places and we went to the archives of all these places and tried to find out more, and with lots of translations being done. The second half is about our lives with them and what that was like, and how Mm -hmm. their psyches were affected, how their personalities were affected, and they were severely affected, unfortunately, and about how that affected us. And there Mm -hmm. are some funny stories and some very heartbreaking stories along the way, certainly for the second part. Mm -hmm. And the first part was just finding out the names of these people, and that actually was also heartbreaking. I especially... 
remember finding out the names of my father's two little girls. Mm. Uh, they were, they, uh, they and their mother, my father's first wife, were were gassed at Auschwitz, and mm. the girls were four and one and a half, and the names were Ada and Feigle. And when I found out their names, and even as I'm talking to you now, I have a hard time not sort of choking up. Uh, it because yeah. they just became real, and in and in a strange way, I felt that they were my sisters, and it it it, it, it was a mess. <laughs> mm, yeah, and, and so the the book tries to go from beginning to end of their lives, and where we found where I find things out. We go to Sweden, where we actually meet somebody who met who was in the not in the camps with them, but who was in. Sweden when they were there and knew them and actually had pictures of us in her attic of all places. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1998, just after my mother died. So uh, it, it was, it was an emotional journey and, 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 and it was a mystery because uh, so many of the documents were, were destroyed uh, mm -hmm. during the war. Right. It, it's, I mean, from what I understand from reading, they pretty much, uh, Nazi Germany just wanted to wipe out Israel altogether, culture, people, everything. Right. So uh, the the title of your book is called Painful Joy. And so I was interested to know what inspired that title. And then uh, I, th I think you've already shared just some of the difficult things about writing it. But what, what were some of the things that brought you joy uh, in writing this book? Or, or was, did anything, <laughs> was there anything? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I actually was I, just from a sort of a intellectual point of view, I was, mm -hmm. I was excited when I learned anything new because mm, uh, I had sure. known no, nothing. And I would call my sister who really didn't want to know mm -hmm. very much. My sister again was affected much more than, than I was. I think she knew more of what was going on and, and when they would fight and all kinds of other things that would happen when we were young, mm -hmm. uh, I think she she sort of was worried that when my, whenever my father would actually run out, because they were never meant to be together. I think what what one finds is that survivors married other survivors. Mm -hmm. They met in DP camps. They met uh, my my father and mother met in a in what was called an aliens camp in in Sweden, and they each had had similar stories to tell about how they suffered and who they lost. And so they felt that, that those people would be the only ones who would understand them, I think. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of this was conscious, but but that's what happened. Uh, so the, 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 the book, Painful Joy, uh, the, the, the title comes from uh, a poem that I happened on that was written in the Middle Ages. And it was about uh, the fact that Love can never be the same once it's touched by death. And, that, and there's a copy of the poem in, in the book. And the, one of the biggest surprises and joys that I had in, is discovering a letter that my father wrote, because we never thought that they loved each other. I mean, they, they certainly never showed it. There was very little affection. There was mostly fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mostly... My mother often saying that she's going to kill herself, and she walked around with a knife a lot, hmm. sadly. So yeah. disturbed bunch. Uh, but I found a, a letter in the archives in Sweden, uh, which was a letter from to a lawyer who was helping refugees. And my father had uh, first cousins who had left Poland in the 1920s, and they lived in New York. And he was trying to emigrate from Sweden to see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he writes this letter, and it was in Yiddish. And so I had to translate it. And it's a letter about how he met this woman, to be my mother, and she had lost everyone and everything as he had. And he lo they loved each other. They fell in love after two days. And... He wanted to find a way to bring her to the United States, and he had already filed his papers. And is there any way for it to save her because she is all alone? 
and the, and it was just it was written beautifully in beautiful script actually uh, mm-hmm. in uh, in Hebrew lettering, and uh, it was the first time that I understood that at least at the beginning they loved each other, mm. and and that was that that was startling startling to me. I can remember, um, and I, I think I've shared this story before on my podcast, but uh, when my grandparents both had um, had passed away, we found some of their love letters they wrote to each other during World War II. And they were both in, in the army. My, my grandma was an army nurse, and so she had a rank and everything, and she thought that was pretty neat. But even just seeing them, you know, writing the, like the romantic love letters to each other that mm-hmm. I can't imagine them doing that, you know, because I only knew them when they were in their older age and it, it seemed weird, but it in some way made them more alive to me in that moment, yeah, you know, it made them alive and, and, and made them they're you know, they're showing their emotions, their, mm-hmm. They're letting it all hang out, and and they're being, I think, as honest as they can be. You know, when mm. it's just the two of them, it's not like it's being published anywhere, or right. they're sharing this with anybody else. They're just sharing right. it with each other because it's a it's a real emotion, and and I and that that was just wonderful to see. And and the other joy I had, a joy mm. only in the sense that in the archives in Krakow, we had found pictures of my my mother's father and my mother's mother so my grandparents Mm -hmm. theory and uh and then we went into schindler uh, oscar schindler's you know schindler's list so oscar schindler's factory is in krakow Mm -hmm. or right outside of krakow and so you go there and there are all kinds of exhibits and we had seen this man uh jacob and my my grandson is named after him and uh, we had seen him the day before, and we're walking around in in this uh, in this exhibit, and there, staring at me, is my grandfather, in a picture taken around 1940 uh, in the ghetto, uh, and and there he is, and I wow. just couldn't believe it. I said, you know, I just met him, and here he is. Yeah, it's, you know, and I was just so excited. Wow, oh, that's amazing. You know, when I I hear these stories and realizing the impact it has on people and different things and and our society and all that, we realize that hate is a very, very powerful um, emotion. (laughs) You you know, it can cause great damage. Mm -hmm. And I I really don't like it, too, when when people... And I I don't know, I've heard mostly... uh, Sometimes a celebrity will say something like this, like, you know, this is like Nazi Germany around here or something, you know, with different movements and different thoughts that are happening in our world today. And that always bugs me because, you know, I I feel like let's maybe find a different illustration to use because I don't think it's, you know, your situation is that bad. But sorry, this is kind of a complicated, multi-layered question here. But on the other hand there's always a very real danger that history can repeat itself. And I got to remember that too, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So what are your, um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that about how, how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Yeah. I, I think two things. One, I think that when, when you start thinking about what, what happens now, Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the worst part of it is when, one looks at somebody else that you disagree with politically or or in any other way really mm-hmm. and and you it is such a, a point of contention that you you would you'd rather that they were just gone that you know and 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 that's what would happen uh with 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 Nazi Germany i mean basically people were led to understand that the only way that the German nation could survive is if they killed all the Jews. It was mm-hmm. it was a holy war of sorts, mm-hmm. uh, and this would because they were the root of all evil, and 
when you start looking at someone that are, has, is from a different background or you disagree with or or anything uh mm -hmm. when when you make it so that i for me to survive you have to not live it is so and and we've gotten to that point i think in a lot of the rhetoric that you hear uh yeah. that that it it's it's a very dangerous point to get to because at that point you're 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 treading in a place where where the only solution is as as the nazis had the final solution mm -hmm. and with whether that's individual so when when you see some of these people who go and ra randomly shoot uh asians or attack jews or whatever it, mm -hmm. it's sort of like i have to do this they're compelled to do this because these these people are not people anymore and that's exactly what the germans did the nazis uh, I, the, uh the joseph mengele uh called the angel of death in uh in auschwitz who did the selection and did actually the selection when my mother was there uh selecting her to live and actually her sister to die mm -hmm. uh when joseph mengele was asked once because he had escaped to south america i think after the war uh how could you do this how could you take these children and these little kids and these mothers and frail old people and and send them to kill and he said he looked at these people and they were ghosts they mm. were already dead mm. every one of them was mm. not alive and hadn't been alive for a long time so he was just sending them off to where they have to be anyway hmm. and and it's that sort of the black and white world in which the nazis lived uh that that i think could destroy mm -hmm. everybody else one thing i i'm seeing kind of trending is we we begin to stop seeing people that might be different from us whether look or culture or whatever and and we start devaluing them as a person right exactly it's because you've become my enemy and then you've become like somebody i wish weren't even around anymore and you know and you might think well i'd never go that far but you know how how many would have said that in in nazi germany but then it yeah. did end up that far just because of that path they begin to, to walk down yeah it, it it's a very dangerous uh, path and i think we're you, we're not that far from yeah. from it in in the in, in this country and certainly in other countries as well and yeah so w would you say that's one of the lessons you hope your book will would teach people yeah is... I, I i wanted very much mm -hmm. uh i i became much more conscious of it once i started finding out the names of all these people and the ages and when they were killed and how they were killed there there were even documents uh, the Germans were very good at keeping some documents that, that weren't destroyed, where I find out that my my mother's uh, oldest brother was in Mauthausen, and he was killed by a lethal injection to his heart five days before the uh, the camp was liberated, sadly. And oh, yeah. and so you find these things out, and but the, you find out their names, you find out dates when they were born, you find out the name, and the more you you they can be identified as human beings, mm -hmm. uh, the same way I I had emotional reaction when I found out about my father's uh, daughter's names, his for, from his first family, yeah. and uh, they become real and they become much harder to not like or hate even mm -hmm. and you know because because hate is i remember you know we used to tell my mother we hate you you mm -hmm. know because we were angry at her about something yeah. or other usually we were right she was wrong but nevertheless mm -hmm. uh and you know and and it comes back and you say oh i i really shouldn't have said that i mean of all things i you know i was angry at her mm -hmm. but but hate is like you you cross a line mm -hmm. Because what hate can do is exactly genocides are what hate can do. When you, mm -hmm. you, as you said, when you devalue a person to the point where they're not a person anymore, you can do anything to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, look what happened in in Ukraine. 
yeah. uh, with the Wagner Group and the, the Russian soldiers in Bucha and all of that. that it, it's, it's the same. Right, right. And, you know, unfortunately, the, you know, the genocide and Holocaust didn't end with World War II. I mean, it, it's happened to other cultures and other societies even since then. I think it's an understatement to say, you know, that needs to stop, but <laughs> it, it's, uh, I, I guess I, I just keep coming back to, I, I have to look at these people as, as people, uh, you know, just right. like me and what makes my life better than theirs. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're the same in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and the ways that I think my parents survived their survival in a sense was mm -hmm. making up, they, they made up stories about their past, mm -hmm. uh, which turned out mostly not to be true, but they, I think they just so couldn't live with what happened. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't, you know, those pictures of hangings and, uh, my mother would always tell us stories every night, sadly, about uh, in, in Plaschau, this Eamon Get who would sit in, on his terrace in his villa and shoot people in the morning mm -hmm. before breakfast. Mm -hmm. And she would be standing in the yard there and somebody would fall down dead next to her. Mm. And, uh, and that sort of random world uh, was, was just was 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 too much to bear mm -hmm. and so they had to come up with another world and they came my mother had a fantasy life she told us stories that were clearly untrue as i mm -hmm. found out my father even he couldn't live with the guilt of surviving i think so he made stories up too you know one of the what i think i appreciate about your story is that it it shows the aftermath of all this you know sometimes in the in the hollywood film or, or things like that you 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 get up to the point where everyone's liberated you know the war is over and we'll all go home and get back to life as normal but I, what you know in some cases that period of history had a profound effect on the surviving the, the survivors and then like you yourself the the next generation even impacting you you uh, your generation. Yeah, yeah it, it even did, have, you know, there, there's a chapter in the book about the effects, mm -hmm. and and it even affected what they call mm -hmm. epigenetically. So mm -hmm. basically, because my, my parents were starved in the camps, literally starved, mm -hmm. uh, their, their cortisol levels, that the fight and flight response, so when, when you have fight and flight, so the adrenal glands push more cortisol into you to so you could react much faster. So people who are starved, their cortisol levels change an awful lot. And when my mother breastfed us, we got her cortisol levels into us. Mm -hmm. And the DNA that was changed in her became our DNA in that particular way. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, my sister and I both have an extraordinarily hard time. We we get stressed out very quickly, and we can't come back from that. We have a very hard time, and that's that's what fight and flight is. Flight is supposed to help you after the danger to come back, so you can then rack, act rationally. And both of us have a very hard time doing that. And I think it just has to do with with what we got from our parents, mm -hmm. nothing their fault, and what they got from their experiences mm, and yeah. it actually can change your DNA. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've read about that. Um, <clears throat> you know, even in my own life and, you know, I've had struggles with anxiety and, and depression and things. And, you know, then I start thinking, well, you know, how much of this did I inherit from my parents and what, what experiences did they go through that might've yeah, exactly. caused some of that? And yeah, exactly. You know, and, and these were, I mean, they, I'm sure your parents had, Maybe not quite as dramatic or extreme, right. but but you know it 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 can often have the same effect. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of degree. Yeah, yeah. Well, I you know I think I think there's still hope for us. You know that we can avoid these kinds of tragedies again in the future. 
Uh, but it comes down to, I guess, coming back, coming back to that word hate again and, and avoiding hate, valuing people and realizing that boy, life is, is such a, a sacred thing almost. Uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, it's a very profound thing and treat it with, with, uh, respect and with love. I think that will go a long way. Yeah. And, and hopefully more, more schools. There are some places where schools have to have a Holocaust, uh, curriculum. Mm-hmm. And I think in New York there, that's certainly true. I'm not sure about other parts of the country, but I think it's important for, cause there are a lot of kids, not just in the United States, but around the world. I mean, mm-hmm. recent surveys show in, you know, that younger kids, meaning like kids in their teens, Mm-hmm. have no idea that there was a Holocaust and don't believe it if they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think they need to be taught. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know um, my kids' high school, I don't know if it's required in Iowa, that's that's where I live, but mm-hmm. um, their history teacher makes a point of, of teaching not just about the Jewish Holocaust, but some of the others that happened in more recent oh. history. Oh yeah, I mean it's 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 all it's all the same. It's just how mm-hmm. how big it is and how you know I think the the Jewish Holocaust happens to be unique in in perhaps the amount of attention that was paid to doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 system that was created was extraordinary. The yeah. killing machine system that they had was beyond imagination. You know, like they would. They would instead of using the rail cars to transport soldiers, they use them to transport people into the death camps. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it made no sense. It was, I mean, everything made no sense, but this this made even more no sense. Right, right. Thank, thanks uh, for for your stories and and others who have shared the stories, either their own or of parents of grandparents. Hopefully, you know, in the future we can be more aware of that and and avoid such tragedies from happening again yeah i hope so i hope so because uh once was too much right absolutely uh if maybe somebody's interested in writing their own memoir or the story of their parents or grandparents mm-hmm. um would you have any advice for those who might be setting out on a journey of their own to to yeah, write a book i i think what what you end up finding i mean there there are now so many you know websites that are available and and that don't cost anything or if mm-hmm. they do it's small amounts uh i think they should do it i think they'll find much more than they ever thought i was em- embarrassed when i found so much so quickly and then mm-hmm. it took me a long time to find a lot more less quickly Mm-hmm. But uh, I think it it uh, they'll be they'll have so many victories at the beginning because they'll find things out that they never knew about. Uh, there, I don't think there are many families that 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 really trace their histories back very far, or mm-hmm. or maybe they once did, but not so much anymore, and. Uh, I would just go to you know ancestry.com or any of them and uh, mm-hmm. you'll you'll find an awful lot and I think once you find a little you'll want to find out more mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's you you get hooked yeah uh, you know I, I mean I I think uh, in in my own case I I spent five years doing this uh, one of those years writing but the other is really just looking and visiting and traveling and and all of that and I I could have done more. I stopped because I just said to myself, "Enough, enough. I have to write this down." Mm-hmm. Uh, and but what I did was I put footnotes in and bibliography so that if any of my children or grandchildren ever want to look at it more, there are places mm-hmm. they can go. There are breadcrumbs in that book, and I think anybody who starts this process won't want to stop. It, that sounds like my my wife's grandfather when he retired, he kind of got bored real fast. So um, my wife's grandmother told him, "You need to find a hobby or something because you're driving me crazy." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so he he started researching family history and really got into it. And um, they traced their family name 
really far back, about as far back as they could go, I guess, from what I've heard. But he, he's, he ended up having this almost like a book of just all the family history and who lived where and who did what and all that is really neat. Yeah, and, and the more you can find out and, you know, and the, and the other thing I tried to do, and I think they could do as well is mm-hmm. put it into context. So start thinking about what was going on in 1870 or wherever they were, because that's in, in this book, I try to actually put everything I found within some historical context, what was going mm-hmm. on at that time? How was that affecting them? And then it becomes a much richer experience because you start understanding the times that they were living in mm-hmm. and what they were doing and how they were making a living and the kinds of places they'd be living in. I know on my dad's side, we have some history traced back. Um, my my cousin, who she's about my age, she does a lot of it. Uh, and, you know, we, we were able to trace family back through Norway and found, you know, there's a big Norwegian migration, um, I think it was 1800s sometime. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's when my family came over to the United States and I'm like, oh, that's, that's so neat. That's so neat. Have you ever uh, considered going back to Norway or have you been back to Norway? Um, I, I haven't, but she has, and uh-huh. she was able to find some farms that our family used to, to live on and, and some like distant cousins now, but they're still running the farm and they welcomed her like she was a long lost relative, you know, <laughs> well, she was, yeah. but yeah, <laughs> they no, were, it was great. We, yeah. we actually discovered, uh, my father had a niece in mm-hmm. Israel Oh, uh, from his first marriage. He mm-hmm. didn't know that, or I, we never heard about it, but I found her online somewhere mm-hmm. and, and we meant to see her. Yeah. Good. Well, and then, uh, do you have any future projects on, in the work? Well, I, I, have a, I, I hate to say I've been toying, and, and my, my wife keeps telling me that I'm being an idiot, but uh, uh, I, I was toying at one point with the notion of doing uh, a, a book that would be a fiction book, but it would be, what if the Holocaust hadn't happened? Mm-hmm. So what would my parents what kinds of lives would they have had with their first families if my sister and I were never born, if they were back in Poland, and if they were doing what they were doing before September uh, 1st, 1939, uh, what would have happened to them? And Mm -hmm. what kind of families would they have had? And would they be any different? And I did a little treatment, uh, sort of a 20-page treatment of what that might have looked like. And it was fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it just something to kind of kind of get yeah. the the what if you know. Yeah, just yeah. you know, like if if you can't sleep, you you do that. I sure. Know. Yeah, <laughs> I hear you. All right. Well, uh, Max, thank you again for coming on and talking to us about uh, your story and and your parents' story. Um, and again, the book is called Painful Joy. And it's one I would highly recommend everyone read. Uh, So, Max, thank you for coming on today. All right. Thank you for having me. I I enjoyed it. You bet. Uh, Oh, uh, one quick question. Um, Do you have a website or something you would direct people to 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 find your book? Uh, Just uh, it's Amazon. Okay. Just go to Amazon and put in Painful Joy and... I think you'll get some strange thing about some song, but beyond <laughs> yeah. that, you, you'll you find the book pretty quickly. And it's, uh, I think the hardcover is on sale these days. So, all right. <laughs> and, and you can always get it through Kindle Unlimited and all of that. Yeah, I, I have the uh, uh, Kindle version. And... Right. All right. Well, Max, thank you, thank you again. And uh, again, folks, uh, read the book. It's it's well worth it. So you, you take care, Max. Okay, you too. Thanks a lot. Well, I want to thank Max Friedman again for being on the podcast. I have been able to finish reading his book, and it really is a powerful, powerful story. If you are interested in reading more about the Holocaust and World War II, just a couple that come to mind. One is a book I've read just recently that uh, Nancy Chernin had recommended uh, to me called It Rained Warm Bread, and it's the story of Moshe Moskowitz's experiences of the Holocaust. And it's written kind of as a, as a 
in poetry form. Apparently it's uh, a middle grade or young adult reading age, but I, I felt like it was just right for me and still carried a very powerful descriptive punch that the themes in the, in the language used um, was, was so moving. It's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read. Again, that's called It Rained Warm Bread, Moisha Moskowitz's Story of Hope. And then I would, a, a classic book on the subject is uh, Night by Ellie Weissel. That story is absolutely brutally tragic, but I've read it a couple of times because he's such a powerful storyteller and it tells about his experiences um, during the Holocaust in the concentration camps and what he went through and the family he lost. And I'm sure that's a name that is familiar to many of you. And then another book I want to read is uh, Schindler's List. I have actually not read that yet, but I'm going to go ahead and put that one on my TBR list. It is a, a story that Max referenced a couple of different times. And I, I feel like maybe I need to, to read that book now. And, and so I'm going to put that on my list. So those are a couple of recommendations in a book that I'm going to be putting on my TBR. Uh, if you have any stories or books about this time period that you think is worth sharing, please let me know. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. You can check out the show notes for ways to um, help support the podcast. And so until next time, happy reading, everyone, and take care. <laughs>